I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Be seated. Before we get started, just a quick note. Uh, you probably noticed uh, Gene Casimir had to leave, not feeling well. I have uh, reached out by text to her daughter, and the daughter is going to be checking on her mom. So that should be okay on that. We pray everything is well. Second, uh, Christy, Christy Landrum is in UAMS in Little Rock, uh, undergoing some tests. I know that Derek and Christy and Tom and Pam and the whole family would appreciate our prayers. So please keep Christy in your prayers and please keep Gene in your prayers. Programming note, Romans Road to Living for Jesus 24-7 now airs a repeat on every Wednesday morning. So if you didn't catch it on Saturday, you can catch it on Wednesday. We are doing a sermon series, questions that Jesus wants to ask you. These are actual questions that Jesus asks individuals. Sometimes he asks groups. And we're taking those questions and we're applying those questions to our own life today. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I did not plan to do this question tonight. When I start a sermon series, I'm very <laughs> methodical. I'm very organized. When I start a sermon series, I will actually outline every lesson in that series before I start lesson one. And then as we come time to do each lesson, I will complete the lesson and, and send Bob the, uh, the PowerPoint for that lesson. In my original plan, this lesson was not included. But in the past week and a half, I have had 11 people reach out to me. They're worried, concerned. They said, Michael, it seems like there's just so much. There's just so much happening in our world. Human tragedy surround us now daily. The storms, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the shootings, drug abuse, crime. Just a few years ago, the pandemic. And then we go back to 911 and the attack on our country. It seems that human tragedy is ever growing. Should we be concerned? Should we worry? Now, I'm going to give you the short answer, then we're going to do the long answer, okay? The short answer is, don't worry. We hold the hand of the Almighty Creator. As Christians, we hold His hand and we can trust that He will guide us and He will take care of us. We can trust our God to never forsake us. So the short answer is, don't worry, trust God. But here's the long answer. Let's talk about it tonight. Some, some have asked me, in fact, nine of the 11 asked me this question, where is God when we need Him? That same question, phrased a little different, appears in Luke 13. Let's look now at Luke chapter 13. Let's begin in verse 1. They were present at that season, at that time of the year, at that moment, there were some people present who told him, who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. These were people that were trying to worship God. We have a historical context for this. <clears throat> These were people trying to worship God, and Pilate had killed them. They asked. They told Jesus. 
They're asking Jesus. You respond. How do you respond to that? And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans? Were these the worst people in all of Galilee? I'm going to say to you, no. <laughs> they were trying to worship God. These were probably some of the better people of Galilee. Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? Is our suffering, is it tied up with our life? In other words, if we live a right life, are we going to suffer less? Hold on. Let's read on. Jesus said, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's the first time he says it. He'll say it twice. Anytime Jesus says something twice, you better believe it's important. Verse 4. Or how about those 18? On those 18 of whom the tire in Siloam fell, Jesus pulls out a historical event. How about those people who died when that large structure fell on top of them and killed them? Do you suppose they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? You remember that story, that event about that tall structure falling down and killing those people? Were those people bad people? Were they the, the worst sinners than all other men? Verse 5, he repeats, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What can we get from this story? What can we get from this story to help us today? as we face a time in our world that I'll just tell you, it's crazy. It's crazy what things are happening in our world today. Well, I think we can get some, um, some hope here. Let's talk about the context. If you look back in chapter 12, in verse 56, Jesus had spoken about discerning the signs of the times. You know, you look at the weather, you know what's going to happen. You see the sky. Well, you should understand that we're living in troubled times. Then the report comes. How about those Galileans that died? Folks, life can and will look unfair at times. Life itself is not a bed of roses. Life is unfair. Why? Well, the truth is we live in a world cursed by sin. Our world is broken. And our world is fallen. And we live in a world like that. The sin of Adam and Eve opened a Pandora's box of troubles and sufferings. Notice what Paul says in Romans 5. Therefore, based on what he'd already been talking about there, therefore, just as through one man entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. What, what are the consequences? What are the effects of Adam and Eve's sin? Well, death, fear, pain, sorrow, a cursed ground, sweat, hard work, the shedding of blood, false worship, jealousy, anger, murder. I could go on and on and on. You see, God made a perfect world, and mankind, mankind messed it up. But you can't blame the bad on God, because it's mankind who has made his perfect world imperfect. But does God care about human suffering? 
That was the second most common question asked. Does God care when things are bad? Does God care? Remember that song, Does Jesus Care? In the chorus it says, oh yes he cares. I, I know he cares. Let's examine the evidence the evidence of the caring compassion of our God. Notice verse number four. Jesus was already aware. This was not news to him. He was already aware of the tragedy. He was the one that brought up the situation in Jerusalem. You see, Jesus, as he went through his ministry here on earth... Jesus constantly demonstrated his loving care and concern. He saw that widow at Nain who had lost her son. What does he do? He raises that son. He, he sees that, that lame man at the pool in Jerusalem needing help, and he heals that lame man. He sees blind people. He sees deaf mute. He sees people in need. Remember that woman with the issue of blood? That is compassion. That's the loving care that Jesus constantly demonstrated throughout his ministry. That leads us to Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. What a great statement, a confident statement. It says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. The high priest, by the time of the New Testament, the high priest had, had really disconnected from the people. No longer was the priest connected to the people. He was, he was a pawn of the Roman government. He was a pawn of the Sadducees that controlled everything. He was all about the money. Our high priest is not like that. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus experienced what life dished out to him. And it was hard. It was difficult. Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 5, 7 that we are invited to cast our cares upon Him for He cares for us. Why did God give us the avenue of prayer? God gave us the avenue of prayer so that we could what? Lean on Him. How comforting, how helpful, how reassuring to be able to go to a God who will listen to our prayers. That is hope, friends. Now, what do we do as humans? The 11 people who reached out to me are doing exactly this. Do you suppose... Do you suppose that these are the last days? Well, to that question, I said, yeah, we are in the last days. I don't know when that last day will happen. But yes, we're not in the patriarchal time period. We're not in the mosaical time period. These are the last days. The Christian age is the last days. But I can't say that the Lord's going to come next week or next month or next year or the next decade. I don't know, and you don't know. So I said to them, you've got to be ready. Whenever he comes, you've got to be ready. They said, do you think? Do you think that? Well, one person said it like this. Why did all this happen to me? One of the 11 has had some horrible things happen to her. She said, why did this all happen to me? She said, what did I do to cause it? Did this happen to me because I have unconfessed sins in my life? You know, that's what the people in Luke 13 thought. They thought that, hey, 
they deserved what they got because they were bad people. Do you suppose that they were really bad people, Jesus says? No. Their assumption was wrong. Just like the assumption of the three friends of Job. His three friends come to him. And let me summarize what they do. Job, <laughs> you are doing something wrong. Tell us what it is. Why is God punishing you, Job? You must have done something really bad. That's not the case. That's not the way it works. In John chapter 9, Jesus encounters a man born blind. His disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man was born blind. Was it the man who sinned or was it his parents who sinned? Jesus corrects them. That's not what it's all about. Jesus will use that opportunity to heal that man and to bring glory to his ministry. The Bible does not teach that every time there is a tragedy. It does not teach that every time there's a tragedy, that it's because someone is being punished for their sin. It's true, tragic events are made possible by sin that has made our world broken. But not every particular tragedy is payback for someone's individual sins. Illustration. You could have two people in a car wreck. One dies, the other one lives. Why? It just happens that way. Or how about a wife? A wife who suffers at the hand of an abusive, drunken husband. What caused her to have to suffer? Once again, we live in a broken world. We live in a world that is, well, just dedicated to sin. My best example of that is abortion. Think about all those babies who are aborted daily. A friend of mine, who is a doctor in Jonesboro, as he was training to be a doctor, had to witness an abortion. He wrote for me an article of what he saw. It's horrible. Horrible. But babies are aborted daily. That's the kind of world that we live in today. In verse 14, the 18 who were killed by that structure, they were just doing their job. If we look at history, and we try to combine history with this passage, these people were workers on this job. Yet they died from no fault of their own. I'm thinking about 23 years ago, the about 3,000 people who died on this, in this country when we were attacked. Many of them just going to work, an average day for them, and they died in the consequences. God sends his goodness on the just and unjust. This world is not fair. It hasn't been a long while time, but heaven will be fair. Heaven will be perfect for all of us. Living righteously does not exempt anyone from trouble or tragedy. I've known good people who have suffered loss. You probably know good people who have suffered loss. Just consider for just a moment the prophets of the Old Testament, the apostles in the New Testament. Think about how they died. Many of them suffered. To our knowledge, all the apostles died an early death except one, John. That's the best of our human knowledge. They did not have an easy life. But God did not promise us an easy life here on earth. God promised us heaven. It would be worth it. We should do right whether it pays off in this life or not, because it will pay off in heaven. 
will have that reward. When tragedy hits, use it as an opportunity to be drawn closer to God and make Him look good. Notice the answer of Jesus. What did He say both times? Verse 3, verse 5. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus knew that life here on earth, that's not the big picture. The big picture is life eternal in heaven with Him. God is more concerned with your eternal destiny than your physical existence here on earth. So the real issue tonight is this. Have you and I repented of our sins? Have we obeyed God? Are we ready to meet God? We have a young lady, so proud of her, who made that commitment this morning to be a Christian. Are we ready? Whenever the Lord returns, are we ready to meet our God? From my box of personal stories comes a story of Bob. I met Bob at St. Bernard's Hospital in Jonesboro. The nurses all knew me quite well. I was there almost every day. They asked me, would you go by and see this guy? He needs a little cheering up. Let me give you the background on Bob. Bob had had five jobs in his life. Bob was 37. Every job he took, either the company closed down shop and moved it overseas, causing him to lose his job, or the company went bankrupt. His last job was the manager of a blockbuster video store. We all know what happened to those stores. So Bob had not had good success in his career. He he had moved back. Jonesboro. He was living in Memphis, managing that blockbuster store. He had moved back to Jonesboro. That's where he grew up. One day, he saw a lady changing a flat by the side of the road. He did what a good man should do. He stopped to help that lady. He had just got the, the car jacked off, jacked up, and he had got the wheel off, the tire off the car. When a drunk driver hit the car from behind, causing the car to fall on Bob. When they finally got him to St. Bernard's Hospital, the doctor said the only way we can save his life is to amputate both legs. The car had fallen on his legs. There's Bob in a hospital room, and he is down. He is lower than a snake's belly in a wagon rut. He is that down. I found out that Bob was an erring Christian. He had grown up in the church in Craighead County, but when he left home, he had left God. And he hadn't been faithful in all those years. We ended up talking almost five hours. Bob was restored. I contacted some elders in, in town. They came up to the hospital. We all prayed with Bob. He was restored. Bob lived two months. He went to a nursing home. He contracted pneumonia in the nursing home. He died from pneumonia. One of my last conversations with him was this. He made this statement. Let me quote it here. Life here on earth has not been great. I'm going to enjoy heaven so much. Thank you, God. You see... Bob realized what's really important. What's really important is our relationship to the Lord. Tragedies are not opportunities to judge sin in others, but a spiritual wake-up call to repent. 
I never would have wished Bob to have lost his legs. But it took him losing those legs to remind him of a spiritual wake-up call. And he made his life right for those last two months of his life. Tragedies. Tragedies should remind us of the following. Sin is universal. It's all around us. Number two, it should remind us of the uncertainty of life. Bob was still in his 30s, and he died. Guess what, folks? You and I, we're going to die. If we're not alive when Jesus comes, we will die. Life is not certain. Also, tragedies remind us of the urgency to repent. Why did I spend five hours with Bob at St. Bernard's Hospital? I saw my chance. I saw my window of opportunity, and I wasn't going to give up. Are we ready for God to become a Christian once again? One of these days, you're going to get tired of seeing this slide. I've been doing it now for 47 years. To become a Christian, you've got to believe, you've got to repent, you've got to confess, you've got to be baptized. I'm not going to stop reminding you of that. Even though some of our younger preachers say it's not important, to me it's still very important. As a Christian, you need to repent like Bob did. You need to repent. The church stands ready to pray with you and for you. Danny has selected a song to encourage you. Will you please come as we stand and sing for your encouragement?